podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm really thrilled to be here with everyone in New York. Um, I want to thank the, the People's Forum for providing this wonderful venue, and want to thank Jacobin for everything they did to organize this event and everything they've done to support the podcast over the years. Um, and Jacobin has a table back there, I think, with some free back issues, so check that out. And please do subscribe if you do not already subscribe. Uh, this is the first live dig show in a long time, and I can't think of anything more important to discuss than this resurgent labor militancy that's sweeping the country. We're still in what I hope are the early days of something really huge, the true revival of the American labor movement, which is exactly what we're going to need, not only to win working class power in this country, but to just fundamentally change the conditions that make politics so bleak and constrained across the board, including when it comes to things that we don't even think of as, as labor issues conventionally, like confronting climate change, our undemocratic political system, mass incarceration, and war. The, the only way forward is to dramatically grow the organized working class, period. Um, tonight, I'm doing two interviews. First, with Chris Smalls, president of the Amazon Labor Union, and Jazz Brissack of Starbucks Workers United. And then with Rob Burrill, president of 1199 NE, Jacobin writer Alex Press, and Labor Notes writer Luis Feliz Leon. Um, before we get started, a few quick announcements. First, if you are a regular Dig listener, you know, you know that the only way that this podcast is possible is because listeners support the podcast at patreon.com slash the dig. Yes, I even do this in person. Uh, do we have any dig supporters in the house? All right, we got a few. We got a few. It's pretty painless, just even like $5 a month. Uh, so if you are a regular listener, or you're going to become a regular listener after tonight, please do take a moment to contribute. You can do it on your phone right now. That's P A T reon.com slash the dig and there's a QR code somewhere by the door that you can put your phone in front of on the way out. Um, then second, if you're interested in organizing your own workplace or getting more involved with the labor movement, we have people here from EWOC, the Emergency Workplace Organizing Committee, right there next to Jacobin. They support any worker anywhere in the US in any industry to organize, whether you and your coworkers are dealing with like a particular issue or you want to form a union, they can help you. So Ewok has a table, go say hi to them if you want to learn more. And last but not least, you are all invited to a Labor Notes house party and fundraiser this Friday, May 13th, 7 to 9 p.m. right here at the People's Forum. They're raising funds to send labor activists to this year's Labor Notes Conference in Chicago, which is June 17th through 19th. Uh, the work that Labor Notes has been doing for decades is obviously more important right now than it's ever been. Um, I've been a reader forever, and I even like I contributed to Labor Notes as a freelancer way back in 2009, covering Philly labor. It's a just so yeah. Be here on Friday if you're around. Uh, okay. Let's get things started. Please welcome Chris Smalls and Jazz Prisak. So there are no doubt tried and true methods that organizers have applied in all different workplaces, but every company and every group of workers is also distinct. Jazz and Chris, what what did you need to learn about Starbucks and Amazon and about the people who work there to start winning union elections? And speak into the mic. Sure. Thank you. Uh, wow. About organizing Amazon. Um, well, number one, you have to be invested in the company. Um, you, you know, I was invested in the company. I, I spent five years, nearly five years of my life, um, opened up three facilities and I started from entry level and I learned how to pretty much cheat the system to move up 
you know, because uh, you don't last long trying to make rate every day. And, um, you know, I did work hard. I worked hard to learn the ins and outs of the company. And uh, when I became a supervisor, um, I wanted to learn even more than that. So I was invested in the company um, to the point where I knew the company operations better than operations. You know, the managers that they hire, the college hires, the new hires, they had to now come see me to be trained about you know, what their job is going to entitle every day. So when it came to organizing, um, you know, the same thing. I had to be a leader in the building. I had to be a leader with the company. And now I just play for a different team. So I took my leadership skills and I transitioned into, uh, you know, what you guys see today. Jazz? I think echoing what you just said about, you know, taking um, the best things about the company or about the people working every day, we, with Starbucks, really, you know, leaned on the fact that we are Starbucks, that we're not, um, you know, people like Howard Schultz has tried to characterize us who are, you know, coming in to steal their people or an outside agency, but we actually are the people that are, you know, making the customer connections, making the moments right for people, creating the third place. I mean, we completely, um, you know, have embraced um, everything from the fact that Starbucks calls us partners and said that if they call us partners, then we should actually have a true partnership. Um, and I think really, you know, we've come to this because we don't want to, you know, leave our jobs. We want to make Starbucks the best place that it can be. And for me, I was a pretty new hire when the campaign started. I had been there about eight months. Um, and the campaign wouldn't have been possible had it just been me. It was possible because 11 year partners like Michelle Eisen got on board and people who had been serving these customers for years and years who where the customers had very deep relationships and you know, had depended on these people for their daily routines, um, all rallied behind us and gave us strength even as corporate flew in over 100 managers to descend on our city. Um, the customers had our backs. Organizing is all about forming relationships. How, how do you build those relationships both on and off the job? And then, and then more specifically, how do you go about building the organizing committees? the structures that can sustain those relationships? Yeah, well, the same thing. Um, the, the hours you spend with your coworkers, you spend more with your, it's more than uh, your actual family. 40, 50, 60 hours a week, especially working at Amazon, the mandatory overtime, the peak season, the holiday seasons. Um, we're spending so much time together that the people I work with became my family. You know, they became my extended family. I would confide in them the way I confide in anybody because I see them every day and vice versa. They would come to me and tell me, you know, things are going on at home. And to me, I became more than just a supervisor. I was a friend. I was a therapist. I was, uh, you know, whatever they wanted to be, you know, to make sure that their day was more smoothly than actually being on station and being treated as a, a robot. You know, so building the relationships was just several conversations, you know, consistency with conversating. Same thing when uh, organizing a committee. Um, you find your leaders just naturally. You know, the ones that, that really take charge, they put in the effort. It's natural. Um, you don't have to, you can't, teach, you can't teach that. You can't train that. Um, and when you see a natural leader, you know, you want to have people galvanized behind that leader. And, and whatever committee is see fit, you want to make that committee as, you know, as soon as possible, really. Jazz? I mean, I think if you've seen the um, production line at a Starbucks, we're all on top of each other from the beginning. Um, it's a very, sorry, it's a very small space. And, you know, especially during COVID, we were each other's bubble um, when we couldn't interact with very many people because of the public nature of our job and the fact that we were so exposed all the time. We were giving each other rides. We were taking each other to the grocery store. We were having each other over for coffee or tea. And 
I think the union committee very much evolved out of that. Um, in addition, I mean, there were people who'd been talking about organizing a union at Starbucks for years and who were just waiting for the opportunity to really believe it was possible because anytime Starbucks has ever gotten a whisper of union before, they've done very similar tactics to what they did here. But we managed to build and start something that they couldn't stomp out even though they did their hard tried their hardest. And Jazz, what about building that first organizing committee in Buffalo? I mean, we did it so quickly that we didn't even know going into the first organizing committee meeting if we were going to be able to keep the campaign afloat. And it was probably one of the greatest days of my life to see everybody coming into that coming into that first meeting and truly believing that this was going to be possible because that was exactly how it was going to be. Chris, one thing that really jumped out to me reading all the coverage of of ALU on Staten Island was (laughs) that you made sure to have food all the time, but particularly food for for different uh, particular ethnic or national groups of workers. But that's not the only kind of diversity, right? There's black workers, white workers, Asian workers, Latino workers. I assume you have workers who vote Democratic. I'm sure you have Trump voters, voter people who don't vote at all. Uh, how have both of you navigated the different sorts of workers that make up a particular workplace and with all that difference, built a collective identity amongst those workers as workers that binds people together across those differences? Yeah, we... Uh... But what we did in Staten Island, we created our own culture. Um, Amazon has its own culture that's ran completely off of metrics, numbers, no, um, no human interaction. While we interacted, we brought a human aspect to it. We cared for one another. We showed the workers every day that we cared for them. Even if they disliked us, we didn't uh, argue. We didn't sit there and, and um, you know, uh, get into fights. We just continued to pretty much just, you know, kill kindness, you know, kill them with kindness. And um, as far as, you know, how we continue to grow in the building, um, I think workers just respected that, you know, and we stuck to the issues. We didn't get into politics and uh, who's left, who's right, because we knew that, like you mentioned, people are on both sides. And there's people that don't like to talk about politics at the workplace. So, we just stuck to the issues and build off of that commonality. You know, everybody knows working at Amazon, there's something you don't like about it. And whatever that issue was, is that's, that's how we started our conversations. And it led to them getting more involved and to them ultimately getting on board and voting yes. But were diversity and differences uh, ever a challenge? Uh, we had some, you know, um, isolated incidences where, you know, you know, working may uh, express what type of political view they have and uh, somebody else here over here or they see the conversation and they, uh, you know, get a little worried about what direction we're going. Um, but we always just, once again, uh, go back to the commonality of the issues in the in the building, what Amazon is doing to the workers. And when they, when they see that, you know, when we predict that there's going to be captive audiences and we predict that there's going to be people that's walking around making thousands of dollars a day, and they actually see it, they're like, oh shit, this is real. You know, um, when they see a tent go up in the parking lot after me being in a tent across the street in the, the bus stop, they start to see it into reality, like this is real. And um, that, that just helped change the culture into what we wanted it to be. They, I mean, they did try to use differences uh, against you when they early on launched that racist attack against right. you. Right, yeah, I'm a thug, you know. Um, Thug life, um, you know, and um, and it's always going to be that way. You know, I, I'm going to be a thug for workers every day, and <laughs> uh, that's just what it is. Jazz. I mean, I think we overcame attempts to divide us or to appeal to people's preconceived notions of unions or perceptions that you know maybe you had to have a certain ideology to be a union member by just showing that we were the ones who were going to stick up for each other. And, um, you know, we had people from every political spectrum who 
realized that we were just fighting for accountability and to address the very specific issues that they were having within the workplace. Um, if somebody's availability was cut or if somebody got injured, it didn't matter what, you know, who they voted for, what their leanings were. Um, we were all going, going to have their back. And um, Starbucks did, Starbucks is a very, very majority white workplace in many places. Um, it's notable, of course, that most of the people they've fired for union activity have been workers of color, the Memphis Seven, Layla Dalton. Um, and in Buffalo, they originally tried to break our union by hiring majority black workers right before our vote and telling them that the union was going to be, you know, white led and exclusionary. And we just tried to prove that we were going to have everybody's back no matter what. And the people that they brought in <laughs> to vote no voted yes because, you know, they didn't have solidarity <laughs> with Rossian Williams and Howard Schultz telling us to share our blankets. They had solidarity with <laughs> all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, people always say that organizers need to meet people where they're at. Where, where, where are workers at at Amazon and Starbucks when you first meet them? Are they even really familiar with unions at all? I'm guessing it depends on on the person, but yeah, um, we 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 spent uh, a good amount of our campaign, you know, educating the workers. Um, we're talking about a small city, you know. We tried, <laughs> we tried to go for all four at first, so. Uh, we was doing something crazy and um <laughs> you know we talked we had to educate them a lot a lot of them you know and it, it wasn't that wasn't uh, the issue that was actually the fun part you know because um you know people don't talk about unions nowadays at their workplace the way they should and to talk about their rights the rights that they do have um that was also a good conversation and and the beauty of it is that we were forming our own union so forming an independent union that can create uh, the type of culture that we want to have. Um, it just, it just worked in our favor. Jess. Oh yeah. Just like, where, like where, where do people tend to be at when you oh, first yeah. encounter them? And like, do they, are they familiar with, are workers typically familiar with unions in this age when unions have been getting their, their asses kicked for, for decades? It's, there's been a huge variance where some people have come in, you know, trying to organize for years and other people um, have a much, much less of an experience with it or almost a sense of is unionizing even possible in this industry. Um, so I think it's, it was easier in some ways that we were starting in Buffalo because a lot of people had at least some background knowledge, but the campaign hasn't been weaker in places that don't have that union background because now it's, we were one multiple stores in Florida today where people presumably would have, you know, less of a culture of unionization. Um, although as a Southerner, <laughs> I would push back against the idea that any region would be less pro-union. Um, but I think most people want to fight to make their workplace the best place that it can be. And that's, you know, what we've kept coming back to as what a union really is. Workers involved both at Starbucks and Amazon, there's, there's more, you know, conventional workers, people who took a job because it's the best job they, they could get. And then also SALTs, people who take a job because of a political, ethical commitment to organize a workplace. My understanding is, Jazz, you took the Starbucks job in Buffalo a little more as assault with the intention. No, I'm going to push back a little bit. There. Okay. <laughs> and okay, not. Uh, and, and Chris, you definitely didn't. Um, but there are salts involved in all these workplaces, I think. Um, what, how do you each see the role played by, by salts versus more conventional? workers in, in, in organizing at Starbucks and Amazon? I don't think that there should be a distinction. I think Starbucks has tried to, you know, basically red bait <laughs> me in particular and a lot of people across the country that they've accused of, you know, being planted 
by the union with no um, justification or background. Um, but I think, you know, if you're a union person, you would try to organize any workplace that you found yourself working in. And I don't think that we as organizers should make those distinctions because I think it really boils down to, you know, ultimately I'm in the Starbucks making lattes and doing the same job. And it doesn't matter if I'm also somebody who has a second job with a union instead of a second job in the same industry or in a different industry. Um, I think that it, that ends up being kind of a false distinction. Chris? Yeah. Um, well, I can say with our campaign, we didn't have salts from other unions, but we have salts. And um, our salts, uh, definitely their task was to support and still is to support the workers. And there's no difference, but as far as assault, it's just the, the difference I would say is it's just uh, the investment. You know, it's over time, when I mean several years, that they would have to put in. You know, it's not just months or a peak season. You got to really get invested, you know, at least two years. If you can survive two years in Amazon, you can survive anywhere. And, um, um, it, you know, once again, you know, changing your lifestyle to become and adapt into a, um, an, a fully blown Am Amazon worker where Amazon takes over your entire life. Um, that's, that's really salty. And um, we have some, we have some dedicated salts. Actually, I have some here tonight. Where my salts at? <laughs> <laughs> they in the back over there, it's a couple of them. But, um, you know, um, that's, we need them, you know, especially with the bargaining unit that we have, we're talking 8,300, you know, it wasn't gonna come from just workers, um, but it was led by workers, for sure. Starbucks and Amazon, both campaigns have been very, rank and file uh, oriented. But ALU is an entirely independent union, whereas Starbucks Workers United is affiliated with, with SEIU's Workers United. How, how do you both approach this question of figuring out how a rank and file led campaign, which has so much militancy, these organic relationships with fellow workers, how, how that does and should relate to more established unions, which have resources, size, and experience. Jess? Um, I mean, Starbucks Workers United would never have been possible if Gary Bonadonna, the leader of Workers United in upstate New York, hadn't decided to back us up because every prior Starbucks attempt had not, you know, succeeded in winning elections and bargaining contracts. Um, for decades. And I think we couldn't have done it without the backing of that union and the courage that it took to really commit the resources to the fight. Um, I mean, I think, you know, we, our organizer in Buffalo um, was Richard Bensinger, who's incredible. He doesn't like it when I say this, but he's a better organizer than Joe Hill. Um, <laughs> I might be a big fan. Um, Maggie Carter, who's the leader of the Knoxville Committee, and I will have a fight over who's the leader of the Richard Bensinger fan club. Um, but I mean, I think ultimately, obviously, all campaigns come down to having strong organizing committees and really strong internal dynamics. I don't think Starbucks is particularly different than other campaigns um, that we've run in the past. We had other barista campaigns, including the Spot Coffee folks who really paved the way for us to be able to organize Starbucks in Buffalo, especially because it was the same city in the same context. Um, so I think, you know, worker leadership is key everywhere, but I, at least for us, we couldn't have done it without that support. Chris? Um. We didn't have any support, so <laughs> I mean, um, you know what we did. Uh, you, you're gonna have to wait for the doc to see this, but it's <laughs> it's crazy. I I'm telling you, um, yeah, you know we we had to obviously start real grassroots. We 
we didn't have any support, uh, any money, any resources. We had, I think I sent out a tweet. If I go back in my tweets, follow me on Twitter. I sent out a tweet asking for a lawyer about 12 months ago, and I got one reply. <laughs> And he's still with us till this day, Seth, <laughs> Seth Goldstein. Shout out to Seth Goldstein. <laughs> that was it. So I had one pro bono lawyer, about five, six workers, and that's it. And we had no money. We had just started the GoFundMe, had a couple hundred dollars. We went right to Walmart, blew that whole hundred. And then uh, we went outside of JFK and started you know, collecting cards. Um, so to say that we do need support, yeah, we do need support. I mean, it would have been a lot easier, um, but to say that it can't be done, um, I disagree on that. I think that, uh, the power is always with the workers and if the workers want to organize, they can organize. They just have to be aware of that. And, um, you know, that's, that's what we had to prove to these workers that, we had to get to a point where they started to organize themselves. They didn't do that in the beginning. You know, they, they had to have several conversations. I had to be cursed out a lot and I had to endure that. And I had to, you know, once again, watch people walk past me for two, three months, won't say a word to me. But then that one day they came over and I knew that was my chance. So it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And, um, you have to just, be in it for the long haul as a as an organizer. Um, the hardest thing you can do is organize people. I learned that um, in my short two years. So um, you you go off uh, you know what's working for y'all, and if it's working, you know if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Just, Please. Just to clarify, I didn't mean to say that it couldn't be done in any situation. I feel like in the very specific situation of our campaign, I don't think that we could have gotten off the ground the way we did without people having that reassurance because everybody was already, we went into the campaign with everybody terrified of what had just happened a year earlier in Philadelphia where two workers had been fired and still hadn't been reinstated and there had never been an election or any solidification of that. But I mean, y'all are the model for how to do it <laughs> without oh, that yeah. backing. Oh yeah, no, I understand completely. Starbucks, you know, they, um, they, they're real uh, villains. I see how they're firing y'all. So trust me, y'all got to do what y'all got to do. I'm, I'm all for it and with y'all. I want to talk about the sort of union busting campaigns that each of you is confronting at Starbucks and at Amazon. Uh, let's start with Starbucks. Jazz, Howard Schultz recently held a meeting with managers nationwide. And according to labor historian Nelson Lichtenstein, Lichtenstein uh, he wrote, quote, the first thing that became clear in the leak video is that Starbucks store managers are unreliable union busters. Indeed, both Schultz and Roseanne Williams, the executive vice president who spent months in Buffalo trying to stop with you, <laughs> trying to stop the successful union drive there, were practically pleading with store managers to get behind the corporate effort. So two questions. Have you found store managers, people who work pretty closely with workers, to be a weak link in the company's anti-union campaign? And then also more generally, just what sort of anti-union campaign have, have you been confronting, especially as you grow from to like 60 something stores now? Yes. I mean, I think the, starting with the store managers, it's wildly different. Store managers were a large number of the SWAT team that Starbucks sent into Buffalo in the very beginning of the campaign. Um, but I think it's also telling that they had to bring in so many union busters instead of relying on the folks who were there locally, because like a lot of folks who work at Starbucks, um, I think many of the store managers really believe that this is a different kind of company and one that really respects workers and wants a partnership. And certainly we were helped by a lot of store managers. Brittany Harrison um, was one of our first whistleblowers in management. And she was a store manager who was battling a resurgence of childhood leukemia. And she leaked a video to us in the press of a Starbucks district manager talking about what she'd been sent to Buffalo to do, which was to save the company from the union um, coming in. 
and they fired Brittany. Um, first, basically made conditions so miserable that she put in her resignation, and then they fired her before she could even finish out her time, cutting her off of health care while she was going through chemo. And I think there's a lot of people like that in the company. Um, obviously, Starbucks is trying to weed out anyone who would be sympathetic or, you know, help us. Um, but I think it really speaks to the kind of company that we're fighting because it would have been such a great marketing strategy for them to just embrace the union and say, yes, we actually do believe all of the things that we say we believe. But instead, they've gone through every mental gymnastic possible on all of their calls, um, even now saying, you know, um, they're retaliating against any store that even thinks about unionizing or um, unionizes in the future by denying us the benefits that we've literally been asking for at the bargaining table. Um, I think they've evolved a little bit as we've gotten bigger because they haven't sent a SWAT team into every subsequent city. Um, but they've also escalated a lot of tactics, including the firings. So it's not over yet, but hopefully, um, as a labor board keeps, um, condemning what they've done more and more, hopefully we start to see the tide turn and them sign the fair election principles and really come to their senses. Chris, Amazon last year spent, I think, $4.3 million on in, on union busters. What sort of union busting operation did that buy Jeff Bezos? A loss. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. He lost on April 1st. Um, and they're disputing that. You know, the allegations, they have 25 objections. It's all, you know, BS. Um, and, um, you know... Once again, we're going to continue to organize no matter what. I want to give y'all two examples. You know, we we won our first election. We all watched it. Um, we lost the second one. And, you know, the second one, you know, we we had uh, uh, some new organizers to not just the company, but also um, to organizing that we had just a few weeks to really flip coworkers and convince, you know, meanwhile, this is a smaller bargaining unit. Um, Amazon had management coming from all over, um, same thing they do at Starbucks, um, intimidating the workers. It's uh, uh, easier for them to isolate workers. Um, every time I pulled up to uh, even greet one of the organizers, they had the assistant general manager come out with LP, threaten to call the police and because I'm on papers from being arrested, you know, I, I have to leave right away because I can't get in trouble again, um, at least for the next several months. So these type of tactics um, also on top of the millions of dollars um, and then just demonizing the workers. They, they rolled up every single one of our organizers. Everybody's on the write up. They just fired two of our organizers over the, this past weekend. Um, they fired eight of their managers, um, not six. I just found out today it was eight. And um, actually one of them gave me a call today. So, you know, this is also like a store front manager. Uh, we have managers that definitely support it because they knew that uh, there's a system that is definitely um, not working for the workers. Well, to follow up on that, how has Amazon adopted its anti-union strategy since you all won at JFK 8? And how are you, what are you learning about their evolving union busting methods? Well, I just think um, it's the same old tactics. Uh, with, it, it was just um, not enough time for us. You know, we took on a lot, a huge task. We campaigned for over a year and we got to a point where we were really stressed out. And to win the election and come off that high horse, and then get right back into campaign mode the following week um, and only have three weeks to really win another election it was just a lot. So uh, we learned the lesson. And um, the good thing about it is we know that there's 400 plus workers in that building that support the union. So we still have a union in there. Um, and you know now we just have to combine forces um, and reassess and get back to the basics. You know That's what we like to do anyway. 
Um, I'm sorry, what's my question again? No, <laughs> you got it. I'm schooling, I'm schooling people just a little bit. Um, what's the question again about? Oh yeah, d like how their anti-union oh. approach has changed since you beat them. Yeah, and and how how you're having to change your own. You all are having to change your own approach in response to to that. Yeah, the biggest thing um, they did was they tried to uh, uh, scare workers with our constitution. Um, <laughs> so they, yeah, they went that far. They printed out like copies of the constitution and started like, you know, going through it line by line. So of course, workers that looking at a thirty-page document is going to be like, all right, what is this? Um, that was one thing they didn't do in JFK that they they did differently. Other than that, it was just the normal stuff. Um, you know, lies, union busting. I don't know if y'all saw the TikTok, Tammy, Tammy, Tammy. Tammy <laughs> came from that building. Um, you know, things like that, throwing away literature, you know, breaking the ULPs. I mean, breaking the law because they know the ULPs take forever. They just do it consistently. We filed over 45 of them. Um, you know, this is, this is uh, why we have to continue organizing because the pressure that we're applying is going to force the NLRB to be more you know, progressive into, you know, what's going on with these companies. So um, that also extended to my visit at the White House as well. You know, I, was, I wasn't there just to shake hands. I'm telling you that now. They ain't played my audio for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jazz, I think you referenced this earlier, but Starbucks has announced plans for raises and improved benefits for stores that have not voted to unionize and so workers at stores that have voted according to this announcement will not get those improved wages and benefits how is this crude but potentially powerful tactic playing out on the ground amongst workers and and how are you how are you all planning to respond i mean i think like everything i mean it's been pretty devastating in a couple of elections where they've, you know, come in, announced this right before the vote count and had district managers and other managers doing one-on-ones with everyone. They've stopped doing the big captive audience meetings because they figured out that we knew how to respond to the meetings. They were not happy when they brought all of Elmwood together into one and we all confronted the union busters together. Um, so now it's all very isolated, you know, t target the vulnerable people, don't even talk to your committee. Um, and it's been terrifying to a lot of people because they're not even saying, you know, if you have voted to unionize, they're saying if you vote to unionize in this upcoming election, then you're going to make yourself ineligible for these benefits, which we're obviously, you know, saying is not in accordance with labor law, but that's their current tactic. And um, I think more and more people are realizing, oh, wait a second, these are proposals that the union had already asked for at the bargaining table in Buffalo, and Starbucks wouldn't have given these to us if we weren't organizing and if we weren't demanding these things because we've been asking for credit card tipping since we were first having those conversations to put together our organizing committee. We were like, why doesn't Starbucks offer this? Um, but I think, you know, it will continue to have less of an effect as they see what we're able to win as a union. But it's been announced strategically to affect certain elections. Yeah, and also perhaps first contract negotiations. And I presume that Starbucks is going to do what any company facing a new organizing campaign and a successful union election tries to do, which is to ensure that you never win first contracts. How, what do you think their strategy is and how, how do you plan on countering it? I mean, I think right now they think, you know, that they can talk to us in bargaining like we're in a captive audience meeting and keep making the same threats. They've even said when we were talking about, you know, why we should not be treated differently just because we unionized that, oh, you should have to take the negatives with the positives. It sounds like you just want positives. And we were like, yes, that's kind of what the point of having a union is, is we want positives. Um, I'm not, I'm failing to see the problem here. Um, but I think, you know, we keep organizing more stores. We keep building more power and we need everybody's help in putting pressure on 
Howard Schultz and his friends. These are not um, people who, you know, exist outside of public scrutiny. His friends are Melody Hobson, who's making her fortune on union pension funds and is best friends with the Obamas. Um, Howard Schultz was going to be Hillary Clinton's secretary of labor. Um, somebody has to know how to pick up the phone and tell Howard Schultz to stop what he's doing. So That's bad even for a neoliberal Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> they, they usually Democrats at least usually give labor secretary to like someone with union associations. <laughs> yes. No, I mean, it's almost unthinkable to imagine what that would have looked like. Um, maybe we'd have had a lot more blankets. Um, but I think, you know, we just need to put a lot more pressure on Starbucks to really wake up, stop what they're doing, stop running the company into the ground to try to stop the union and actually sign a contract that you know everybody would benefit from chris same question to you basically like you guys winning a first contract is from i think bezos's perspective and amazon's perspective an existential threat to them do you think it'll be even harder than winning the election and how how do you plan to win it if you've been following me from the beginning you know i love being unestimated so we going to get a damn contract. We going to get one. I don't know how. I don't know when. But it's going to happen because, you know, the time is um, is now for us. You know, we know that. And the clock is ticking. And we know that. And I know um, I ain't do all of this for nothing. So uh, I promise you I, I don't know how. But I do know this. We do got support of two important unions and a lot more. One is the U.S. Postal Service. And the other one is the Teamsters. So I, combined, I got about two or three million in my back pocket. <laughs> and that can shut shit down if I need to. So once again, we're going to organize. And um, I already mentioned this several media outlets that we already been contacted by over 100 buildings, every building in the country, probably. The list is growing every day. And um, if we launch, what I want to launch um, is a national conference to set everybody up. They can't avoid us, you know, and they'll be on the, the ALU umbrella and they'll have to come to the table. I want to talk about how to, just that, how to scale this up, what sort of scale is necessary to not just win, but win kind of durable wins at both Starbucks and Amazon. Chris, how, how do you see organizing Amazon warehouses nationwide taking shape? And do you foresee working together closely with particularly the Teamsters in terms of getting warehouses well beyond New York organized? I want to work with the workers. I mean, the union's job is to support us. You know, they uh, we 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 learned another lesson in our second election. You guys seen it. We brought Bernie. We brought AOC. We brought all, every union in New York State and beyond came out to our rally for the first time. They came to Staten Island. And guess what? We lost two to one. It doesn't matter. So I want to work with the workers and the workers that email us and DM us. And I, the ones that I'm talking to, those are the ones that is going to help us win. The ones that have that fire to organize, and those who, those are what I got to do. I got to connect with them. The unions in their particular region or wherever they're going to be, their job is to support those workers. I'm going to make that bridge. They got to help them, and you know my job will be to also support as needed. I'm not going to be able to fly to every state, but I'll go to as many buildings as need be, you know, because I want to make sure that these campaigns is ran. Um, the way that they're supposed to be, you know, and that is worker led. But am I right to suppose that the relationship with the Teamsters is a potentially important one for ALU? Absolutely. You know, I, I've talked to Sean O'Brien. Um, I have relatives that work directly underneath him. Um, we have a great relationship, and that's not just with him and uh, with every, every union I've met so far, the AFL-CIO, um, the AFT, everybody that came to our rally a couple weeks ago. Um, I met all of them, you know, everybody's reached out and, you know, once again, um, their job is to, is to support 
the workers in um, the ALU. You know, we're the ones that unionized. They had 28 years to do it. <laughs> we did it. You know, so I think that we are the pioneers. And if they want to see us get a contract, it's beneficial for them as well. Jazz, you're, you all are organizing shops that are obviously quite a bit smaller than an Amazon warehouse. And you've won elections that I believe as of earlier today, 64 so far, which is incredible. Um, I love Starbucks Workers United is my favorite Twitter account because it's just like good news constantly. Um, how many shops do you think you need to win to tip the balance of power against the company? And how, how do you plan to do that? Have you had to revise your strategy as, as this campaign has moved from Buffalo to this enormous thing nationwide? I don't think there's a specific number, but I want 8,900, which is how many Starbucks there are in the United States. Um, <laughs> I think right now we've been organizing stores very much partner to partner. In the beginning, one of our slogans that we printed on the big banner in our office was partners becoming partners because that was, you know, our whole our point then was that, you know, Starbucks called us partners and we wanted to be true partners, but now it's that Starbucks called us partners and now we're actually partnering with all of our other coworkers across the country to help them organize. And as more baristas learn what it is to go build an organizing committee, go through an election, win your union, start bargaining, um, they've been turning around and helping everybody else do the same process. and. I think that's made it what it is. I mean, when you have people with the kind of experience and um, care and skill that these people are bringing to the campaign, um, not every store is going to um, you know, be Im immediately able to overcome the kind of union busting that's being thrown at us, but we've been overcoming it most of the time. Chris, you in particular have been courted by a lot of politicians from the more obviously pro-labor Bernie to the perhaps somewhat less dependable Biden. What, for both of you, what, what do politicians want from you and what do you want from, from them? What they want from me? Um, I don't know. That's, that's, that's a... <laughs> That's a question you gotta ask them because you know I was I wasn't supposed to be in the White House. I was outside with the guillotine just two years ago. <laughs> they and want the stuff. union drip, obviously. I don't know. No, I'm just playing. But well, it's true. I mean, um, um, what I want from them, they, you know, when uh, when Kamala, VP said, uh, you know, the world is watching me sit next to the president. I said, well, shit, they watching you too. <laughs> so. I'm going to hold them accountable if nothing gets done. That's that's what I went there for. Once again, to to figure out a way of how they can support, and I demanded some things, um, and you know I hope that they follow through. You know they have to do something with these laws. These laws are dinosaurs, and they're not working for us. And I think that we need to uh, put some more funding into the NLRB immediately. Not give Amazon ten billion dollars. You know, so it's just. You know, they know what's going on. They they brought us there, you know, hopefully not just for the photo op, but, you know, there was Starbucks there. There was REI there. There was, you know, um, librarians there, machine union, uh, unions there. Uh, they need to listen to us. If we were brought there to talk and tell our stories, then, you know, they need to follow through because now the world knows uh, who we're going to hold accountable. More specifically, in terms of state and local politicians, what what can the state of New York and city of New York do to put the squeeze on Amazon to help you get that first contract? Well, today I went up to Albany with uh, Senator Ramos to uh, introduce the workers' rights bill, um, warehouse protection bill. So that's a start. You know, if that bill to get passed is sort of like the California bill, where uh, Amazon won't be able to um, write workers up for productivity the way they do. Um, there'll be more transparency with the algorithm. 
Um, it also will provide workers a chance to create a, a committee, a safety committee, where um, that's where the union can ab absolutely assist with that and, and have workers represent themselves whenever they um, get hurt or there's something that needs to be reported. So um, we starting with those type of things. Uh, and also, um, once again, our congressmen and women, they have to uh, put together, they have to pass a PRO Act, number one. That, that's what they have to do. They have to pass a PRO Act. Um, and if they don't pass a PRO Act, then um, I need to talk to one of uh, Biden's policy advisors to tell them that where's that executive order pin? You know, I didn't see that break, you know, any time during the Trump, uh, you know, campaign. So we need you to use that EO and uh, sign something that can help us out. Jazz? I think, I mean, we've had a few very helpful folks, India Walton in Buffalo, came to our first press conference and was great, especially as the mayor, um, Byron Brown, was telling us that we should effectively take a pay cut by lumping, saying that, you know, we deserve $15 an hour, which is less than all of us actually made. Um, <laughs> I think what they want is, I never thought that it would be cool to be a labor nerd, but I think unions are now cool. Um, correct me if this is wrong. <laughs> but <laughs> um, <laughs> I think what we need is, in addition to all of the things um, you already said, the labor board needs even, you know, there's things that they can be doing underfunded or not, like changing the rules back on how long it takes to have elections, because Starbucks is able to drag every store that petitions into a hearing to determine whether or not they can vote as a single store unit despite 60 years of labor board precedent. Under even the Obama administration labor board rules, that was not the case. You had a, I believe, 28 day election period. Um, if we had that, we would have won many, many more stores by now. Um, and, you know, they need to stop appointing people like the current regional director um, overseeing a lot of our stores who is married to a corporate management lawyer who was appointed by Biden labor board folks. Um, so I think we need, you know, to pull Howard Schultz into a congressional hearing and hold him accountable for all of the union busting that he's ordered um, and start focusing on, you know, really making sure these people aren't living above the law. Starbucks hasn't even turned in their LM forms about where their expenditures have been going on their union busting because they think that they're, they're so untouchable. Well, as long as you don't protest outside his home, because that is just, <laughs> that's just a bridge Someone too far. think of the driveway. <laughs> uh, Send me to Addy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both uh, so very much. Please give it up to, for Chris Smalls and Jazz Brissack. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, please welcome to the stage uh, Rob Burrill, president of 1199 NE, Jacobin writer Alex Press, and Labor Notes writer Luis Feliz Leon. Thank you all. Um, so to start out, what, what does ALU's victory tell us about how to organize unions, both at Amazon and, and across the economy? Because a lot of established unions have tried to organize Amazon and, and failed. And really, to be honest, very few people took ALU very seriously before they won at JFK. Does, does this challenge our conventional wisdom in particular about the role that, that staff organizers should or can play. Anyway, uh, well, yeah, I guess we'll start with the with the union president. Well, well, look, <laughs> uh, Rob. I, I, I think that um, I wouldn't start there, to be quite honest. I, I would start with the last 15 years, which has been you know, an absolute train wreck for working class people, white, black, and brown. And I, I think that there's a, a certain element of chickens you know, coming home to roost. Um, you know, but you look at the, you know, the Great Recession and, and the way that, um, you know, we 
okay, are, are now uh, you know, paying the bills for the bankers who wrecked our economy. Um, you know, you look at Black Lives Matter, which in, in my view, more than anything else, you know, really <laughs> returns, I think, the dignity of working class black folks in particular, um, you know, to the work that those of us who believe in racial and economic justice do. Um, and, and, you know, of course, the pandemic, um, you know, where we saw that, you know, essential workers are sent out to die while, you know, billionaires are, you know, jetting off to space and, and everything else. Um, so I think it's been, you know, kind of clear that, you know, it's like organize or die. Um, you know, now, uh, in terms of the question about whether, you know, uh, bureaucratic, dust-covered uh, <laughs> institutions that wouldn't know how to fight if, you know, somebody was kicking them in the, you know, in, in the stomach, uh, can lead a movement of workers that changes this country? Uh, no, no. Um, and I think what we're seeing is that there's initiative of the workers who, again, have been getting their asses kicked for a really long time, but they're going to need to be institutions that marshal resources if we're having a serious discussion uh, about how we organize a movement of hundreds of millions of workers um, you know, to have you know, some uh, amount of power in our society, which I think is what uh, we should be aspiring to. Alex, Luis. Um, I mean, I think there was something that Gerald Bryson said at one of the rallies when asked, like, what did it take to win at Amazon? And he said, some fearless motherfuckers. And I think that's the spirit of what the labor movement needs. It needs fearless fighters. Um, I think for a very long time, you know, the labor movement, I come from this myself. I, I used to work as a researcher at 32BJ SEIU, I worked on new developments where we basically try to track down when a new building was going up to get in a neutrality agreement. That work is important. Um, it created good jobs for New Yorkers, but at the same time, you know, there's something that people miss out when you have those campaigns because you're depending on you know, folks that are committed to the labor movement right out of college, but what you're missing out on is the ingenuity and the creativity of rank and file workers. So at Labor Notes, we like to say that democracy is power. And what we be mean by that is not just that there's power in numbers, but that there's powers in bringing a lot of brains together with that creativity and ingenuity that makes the labor movement strong. I think it's to the credit of ALU that they were able to, you know, I, I, I've been speaking to the organizers for some time right now. When they started the Congress of Essential Workers, and they started going to protest at all these mansions. They started picking up new people. They, Brett Daniels, who is here, um, uh, Casio Mendoza, who's, who's not here. Like, some of these folks were inspired and galvanized by what Chris, Jordan Flowers, Gerald Bryson, and Derek Palmer had started. And they brought in that creativity and created a strong worker-led movement. So what, what um, I remember your question. <laughs> what does uh, it tell us about organizing? It tells us what Labor Notes has been saying to be really cheesy, which is that we need rank and file uh, led movements. Alex? Yeah, I mean, I echo what both the other speakers have said. I mean, I think. Oh. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, so Amazon was seen as this sort of untouchable fortress, this anti-union to its core, you know, even though there have been efforts, even from the first bookstore, the first warehouse that Amazon had on the West Coast decades ago, those efforts never went very far. And there have been efforts elsewhere recently, the Teamsters have been trying to organize uh, some Amazon warehouses in Canada, and they, they haven't won. They have been failing because they haven't gotten this core organizing committee built up of workers who are diehard committed to this project. Um, and and without that, you can't, it doesn't matter what your resources are, right? You can't win. Um, and the flip side is, you know, as Chris said earlier, um, first of all, he always said to me and to everyone who asked, I'm going to win. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's egg on everyone's face that people really didn't believe that. Um, and I think the lesson that shows is, is that if you have a core set of people willing to try things that any more sort of sober, longstanding, experienced veterans of the labor movement would say is impossible, um, you know, if you have those people and they're willing to try and they might lose, um, they might just win. You know, and it sounds really cheesy, 
as a statement, but with Amazon, people were not willing to try and lose. Um, people were very afraid of being demoralized with a loss. People were afraid when Bessemer started organizing that that loss um, would reverberate for years, that no one would ever try again. But certainly like Luis, I've spoken to members of ALU who said they saw that loss and they thought, well, shit, if someone can try it in Alabama, why not try it in New York, right? And so there were people who were brought into JFK 8 who decided to take jobs there um, because they saw what Chris and Derek were doing. And they thought, you know, if people are going to try, I might as well contribute to it. So I think, you know, it's really not a binary here. I think it's good that a lot of established unions now have come hat in hand to the ALU and said, what resource ca resources can we provide? Um, and that's the sort of uh, relationships and sort of um, in cooperation that's going to take for this to spread. You know, ALU is absolutely spearheading efforts to spread this to other um, warehouses. But again, it's going to need those resources from whether it's the Teamsters or whoever else. And so I think really this has been a, a productively humbling experience, for, I think, for a lot of staff organizers. Um, and so I hope going forward that that sort of means that these relationships can can actually be productive rather than butting heads or a sense of scarcity or turf war. Why have companies like Amazon and Starbucks been considered so hard to organize in the past? Is it is it because of particular ways that they run their companies and manage their their workforce? Or is it because it's just really hard in recent decades to organize any private sector company that doesn't already have a union? You can answer in yeah. any order. I mean, I'll just say very briefly that Amazon has a few fundamentals here. One is the high turnover rate, right? Uh, JFK 8 was very lucky in that, you know, the New York Times' story was focused on the numbers they got from JFK 8, which showed a 150% turnover in that warehouse, which means that every few months, it's just a whole new set of workers in there on average, right? I mean, Chris said, if you can last two years at Amazon, you can do anything, and that's completely correct. Um, and it's not just physically backbreaking labor or mentally draining, right? You're constantly sort of in this isolation. Um, you're dealing with repetitive tasks, but it's also the algorithms itself. Um, you know, Amazon now, thank goodness people know this, that people are just constantly fired through mistakes in the algorithms. They can't reach a person. HR doesn't communicate with other HR. You just end up out of a job, right? And so there is a core bit to Amazon's model of churn and isolation that makes it very hard to build a foundation, right? The type which, you know, committed salts can help do, um, to Chris's point earlier. Um, and so there are those fundamentals. And then, I mean, there, it, to your point, like a company like Amazon that is growing so quickly that has no unions present, um, it's the Walmart of today, right? I think, I think, I hope more people are talking about Walmart again now that there's a foot in the door at Amazon. Um, but Walmart similarly was this fortress, right? And unions did make attempts um, to organize and they didn't get very far. Um, and I think there was there's a reasonable sort of thinking to like unions are under attack decades of uh, you know, offensive attacks by corporations and their their sort of counterparts in Congress and elected officials um, that mean you got to conserve your resources. Right. So taking on a Walmart or taking on an Amazon is just unthinkable when there are other warehouses, there are smaller companies, there are unions that need more energy. Right. So it becomes a sort of, you know, this is a sensible choice to not try to pick this fight right now. But at the end of the day, Amazon keeps growing, keeps undermining the entire sector. It undermines people's working conditions in sectors that seem completely unrelated to warehouse work. Um, and so, you know, I think the Teamsters have at least come around to this view for sure that, you know, you're only digging the hole deeper for yourself by not taking this fight on. Rob, Luis? No, I mean, I think um, I would echo what Alex said about turnover, right? Like one of the things that I have found with talking to Amazon workers, um, and I think Chris alluded to this, is that they define themselves as veterans if they've been at Amazon more than like, I don't know, five months. Because counter to to what Amazon's, in, counter to Amazon's intent, which they describe as a march to mediocrity uh, if they were to retain their workforce, right? These workers have have instead said, we want to make these jobs dignified jobs, right? So there has been a shift. Uh, when I went down to Alabama for the first election and I talked to young workers in particular, they would speak about the unionization campaign on Amazon's terms. They would say, these are temporary jobs. You know, I'll be here maybe for a few months before I go back to school. I'm going to enroll in the military. I'm going to get another job. So what you saw at JFKA in particular is that you saw a combination of salts, you saw a combination of veterans, people that knew the warehouse in and out, um, and that was key in terms of organizing Amazon. 
So I know that, you know, last year there was a, a lot of uh, media attention around like Strike Tober. I don't know if we quite got to <laughs> a place of saying that that was like an upsurge. It was an uptick, let's say. Um, but there is something in the air. There's a shift. I don't know if it's a structure of feeling, what Raymond Carver would uh, describe as to justify how there was a Bob Dylan in America, there was a Chico Barca in Brazil. Like there was something, right? So there's Amazon, there's Starbucks, something is in the air, right? We don't know quite what it is. So I don't want to over explain or overstate things. I just don't know what moment we're in, but there's definitely a shift where workers are demanding more. Chris wanted to be in management, you know, and now he's on the other side. We're seeing a lot of other workers do the same. Rob? Yeah, I, I don't know, um, uh, the, you know, the cafe industry or uh, the logistics industry. Um, I do know healthcare, where we're seeing, you know, I, frankly, uh, similar phenomena in terms of, you know, just a very rapid ca uh, concentration and centralization of capital um, as, as some of these corporations just get bigger and bigger. And so figuring out, you know, a, a way that you find a node where you can get an entry point and expand becomes you know, very, very difficult. Um, and, and that is exactly what I think makes the work that Chris and others did uh, you know, uh, heroic, uh, courageous, and more than that, inspirational, and, and hopefully the spark that lights the fire. Because you know, typically, like, major change in this country does not happen through following like, legal proce procedures. Right? The, the, the uh, labor movement as we know it in the 20th century was built through, you know, general strikes in Minneapolis and San Francisco and Ohio and then sit down strikes, et cetera, et cetera, just like the civil rights movement, you know, the, the, the Congress was an obstacle, <laughs> right? Pe but ultimately people, you know, oftentimes do get to a point where it's like, you know, enough, okay? And, and so I think we'll have to see whether we're at that enough moment but again, I do think that the last 15 years have been like a series of these little moments that seem to be generating some, uh, some traction. So let's cross our fingers. A, a follow up on that. What, what, about, what about healthcare coming off, well, still in the years of pandemic? Is there a well of, of pent up anger and militancy that we're going to see burst out in, in healthcare? Yeah. I, I personally have not seen that in terms of unorganized workers. I don't think that that's because it's not there. I, I think it's because that workforce is in trauma that is difficult for many of us to contemplate. Okay. You know, we, we have facilities that my union represents where, you know, nursing homes where literally 50% of the resident population has died. I mean, imagine that. Okay, multiple coworkers in facilities where we have a bargaining unit of 100 people who have died. While the fucking administrator comes in in a full hazmat suit and you don't have a mask. Okay, so uh, what we are seeing is in terms of members who are in the union, folks are not scared. <laughs> you know, they, they've seen their coworkers and loved ones literally drop around them like flies. They're furious. I've never been around people as angry. And so I think for those of us that, that lead in healthcare, I think that it is our responsibility to channel that constructively um, because what we've seen is that folks will just do things that were unimaginable to them a couple of years ago. You know, we started doing civil disobedience and the first time it was like pulling teeth and everybody's scared to do it. And most recently we had one that for reasons I won't get into, we, we, we called off and folks were like, shit, why, why aren't we doing that? <laughs> They were upset with us, okay? So I think that, the, you know, Chris referred to it. There's a way that, that um, you know, if we do our work right, you know, organizing can be kind of sexy, okay? <laughs> Alex and Luis, do you, do you see similar conditions in, amongst teachers, another group of workers who've been through absolute hell and who also, you know, have staged some of the most important pre-pandemic kind of moments of labor militancy from the Chicago teacher strike in 2012 to Red Fred in 2018. The pandemic kind of put that on, on pause because teachers were in total crisis mode. But is there a well of militancy amongst teachers ready to burst back forth? I, I want to sort of answer it in a tangent to that. Go for um, it. 
So, you know, teachers have, have in the United States in recent years been kind of leading the way, as, as you mentioned, the red for ed strike wave and then more sort of recent militancy, even during the pandemic, um, about demanding safe conditions, both for students and for themselves, for workers. And part of that has always been about the fact that, you know, taking the CTU, the Chicago Teachers Union, as sort of the prime example, this inspiring kind of leader on on kind of um, community minded contracts, right? Bargaining for the, so, the common good, as they call it. Part of this is teachers see themselves and are placed into the center of the community, right? They feel like they actually are kind of looking out for not just themselves, but their students. They're often working in the one public community space that exists in an area, right? They, so they feel like they have to act on behalf of and in concert with demands of the community. The pandemic functioned in a very similar way, I think, for a lot of workers, right? Certainly Amazon workers, um, all kinds of workers, whether healthcare workers or, or a variety of you know, food manufacturing workers, John Deere workers, a, a lot of these workers were conscripted into this narrative that you know, you're essential and your continued willingness to work at this job with these incredible health risks for you, you're sacrificing on behalf of the community and everybody in the United States. And that, you know, we're now seeing the effects of that, right? There's not only this sense that, okay, if we're essential, um, you know, you, our, our health is essential too, as I think Chris's sign at his first COVID protest two years ago said, um, essential workers, you know, essential health um, to protest the COVID conditions at JFK 8. Um, but there's also this sense that there was this sort of collective experience that happened, right? That you and your coworkers went through something um, and you were forced to think of each other and in relation to one another, right? Am I going to get my coworkers sick or not? And the bosses and the state did not intend for this to have the effect of building ties in the way that now we've seen where workers stay and fight on behalf of one another. But that's what happened. Um, and so I think that is really important as far as what we're seeing now. You know, we talked about, you know, Luis mentioned uh, Striketober and people have talked about the Great Resignation. And I think Chris probably uh, is the one who said something like, you know, now people are staying and fighting rather than quitting. And that willingness to stay and fight for yourself and on behalf of your coworkers, I think the pandemic is a big part of that story, right? And I think we could go into other sort of antecedents, whether the Sanders campaign or Occupy. But as far as like this, what's changing and whether this is a moment that builds or it's just an uptick that then recedes like so many others in recent years in the labor movement, I think the pandemic is really the sort of skeleton key for unlocking like what exactly is going on? What are the stakes? Also, of course, I didn't even mention, you know, another structural condition, tighter labor markets. You get like, uh, you know, the, the state gives you the $1,600 check, more unemployment benefits. You have people who know they can find other jobs, right? And so there's less to lose. There's more confidence on behalf of the class. And so I think those are all kind of key to like set in a sort of historicize the moment rather than just not to minimize the subjective courage that people like ALU and Jazz and Starbucks workers also have to be willing to take. But that's the context. I think that's really important. Luis? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the legendary communist CIO, organi CIO organizer, William Z. Foster's famous pamphlet, Organizing Methods in the Steel Industry, appears to be making the rounds a lot recently. What what do you think young labor radicals can learn and are learning from the 1930s labor insurgency? I want to know why people are reading Foster. Outside of the ALU uh, party for the first election, I asked Alex, we kind of came to some corner and I was like, were you reading Foster? And Alex shared that she was reading Foster in Pittsburgh last year. I was reading Foster with some folks last year as well. So I don't know what's going on in terms of why people are reading uh, William C. Foster, but I can say this, people are looking for models and what's on offer around them is just not good enough. So they're looking, <laughs> they're looking to the past, right? They're, they're looking to other, um, other traditions. So, I mean, when Chris has his podcast, he had Carl Rosen on uh, to talk about the United, uh, um, electrical workers and the history of that militant union, right, which comes out of the CIO and so forth. So I think that people want it to, if, if, if the idea was a worker-led movement, what can we look to? What examples are there? So I think Foster furnishes some lessons about how do you do that because he lived in a time where folks were forming unions left and right. 
right? That's not, that hasn't been the case. Right now, I think going to your earlier question, the model has been comprehensive campaigns, staff driven, uh, the labor movement has been very risk averse. So the idea of why you do a comprehensive strategic campaign is because at the end of the day, you wanna know that you're gonna win if you're gonna invest resources. You're not gonna take a risk and file with 30% and think that through momentum organizing, you're gonna build up you know, a strong organizing committee. That's just unheard of. Well, I mean, someone from SEIU told me that they've actually done this when I said it was unheard of, so I take that back. It's largely unheard of. In, in healthcare, people have filed, um, I think, with around 30%, but smaller bargaining units, right? Not aware, uh, a workforce of 8,000. Um, so I think that people are looking, and that's always been true, right? Like there's that question of like received history, right? Um, like folks have always tried to couch whatever they're doing in some antecedent movement of one kind or another. People did it in the civil rights movement. Uh, our generation is looking to the 30s for some reason. It's my dream. I love it that people are doing. It. I thought only history nerds did that. <laughs> I'll just I'll just say, um, yeah. When when you asked, you know, or were you reading Foster? And I said yes. Um, you know, and part is I've been writing about Amazon for a long time, and I the reason I was reading Foster is, you know, I was often asking people, you know, many years ago even, I was saying, you know, what would it look like to try to unionize Amazon? And people would say, don't be ridiculous, don't be romantic. Uh, there are other warehouses that people should focus on. And so, but I kept looking into, you know, what are the sort of comparative industries that have something in common with how Amazon functions today? And some people would say, well, what about auto when the UAW was just forming? And it's like, yeah, there are some certain things that those two have in common, but, you know, auto is still more concentrated, right? If you get River Rouge, you get the industry, right? You get Ford. That's such a significant portion of the warehouse or of the industry, the company. Um, Amazon, not so much, you know, JFK eight is 8,300 people, but it's still, it's not like a huge percentage of Amazon's national workforce. Um, and people would start mentioning steel, right. As having sort of a similar distribution of workers geographically, you know, maybe it was a little more concentrated in certain cities. I'm from Pittsburgh. Um, obviously it looms large. Um, but I was having a conversation with the historian, Michael Goldfield. Um, who is also a longtime labor activist, civil rights activist, the author of several books of labor history, and he would bring up steel. And so we had, I did a big interview with Michael where we talked about the comparisons. And, and for that interview, he was like, you have to read some Williams E. Foster. Um, and so I think you know, that it was not directly related to why the ALU folks were in the back of the room and could probably say why they're reading Foster themselves. Um, but I think there are certain parallels, even if the moments are very different, you know, taking an industry that's so rampantly anti-union and where, you know, unions haven't gotten a foot in the door and also taking an eclectic kind of political mix. You know, there are communists um, organizing at Amazon. There are obvious reasons there are that, <laughs> you know, folks would be reading William Z. Foster. Um, and so, yeah, that's just my my personal thinking about that matter. Rob? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just add that. Um you know, Foster was very clear about one thing, which in this room hopefully is not a controversial statement, but that there's a class war and that workers need fighting organizations to not get steamrolled. OK. And uh, how do I say this politely? Mm -hmm. uh, in many sectors of the labor movement, that might actually be a controversial assertion. Okay, there are many people in, in important positions in the labor movement who think our role is to be like, you know, the fucking AARP. <laughs> that wasn't funny. Because they really believe that. And I really mean that. Um, and so Foster was clear that, you know, we got to do something different. Okay, and, and he had a plan. Okay, and the plan involved a bunch of things, which was, uh, you know, a lot of things that Alex just referred to, but... You know, building rank and file committees to build sectoral power in all of the key uh, component uh, sectors of the U.S. economy towards the purpose not of like worker voice or making a little voice for industrial democracy. Right. There, there was an idea there that workers actually had the ability to run a society. And we've come like a really, really long way away from that. I think that it is time for us to be aspirational instead of, you know, worrying about can we get a, a nickel raise? Okay. And I've, 
I've settled lots of contracts where we fought really hard to get a nickel. That was the best that we could do. I'm being a little bit hyperbolic, but not that much. Um, but, but I think this is a different time. And it is time to speak to what people need because we, I think, should be crystal clear at this point in time that, you know, uh, going and, and expecting change to come from who you vote for in November, like, we got to do that. But change does not come through, you know, uh, 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 you know, Congress or the White House. Change will come if, if we raise enough hell, and it's time to do that. Yes, indeed. <laughs> how, how to scale this up at both, at both Amazon as, and Starbucks, as, as I discussed with Jazz and Chris, seems like a very critical question. How, how do you see that happening? Will this require unorthodox rank and file operations like what we've seen at ALU and establishment unions, um, established, sorry, not establishment unions, <laughs> channeling my Bernie, um, established unions working together in, in new kinds of ways that we at least haven't seen in, in recent years. I'm particularly thinking again of the Teamsters, which are under a new leadership that is pledging a militant and organizing forward approach. Um, how do you all see these more rank and file led operations and the established unions that exist working together to bring this to scale? I mean, I think we need we need an upsurge. I mean, I think it's easier to say that obviously than it is to realize one. I mean, there's a instructive piece that Mark Meinster from uh, UE wrote in Labor Notes where he talks about um, in response to like the comprehensive campaigns, like looking to other models of where like how do we grow and revitalize the labor movement? And even if you know we were to staff up every department and the AFL CIO tried this before, right? In terms of going in and organizing and it didn't it didn't produce the results, right, that they had initially intended. Even the goals they set were like were just not met. So the idea is that you need to get as many people as possible into motion. You need to create new institutions um, like ALU, but you also need tenant unions. You need a, a you know, like you need a very vibrant civic life that has been missing from from this country for a very long time. So what I think we've seen with the ALU with Starbucks is an example of momentum organizing. So you can say that it carried through from the uprising of 2020. You could say it began with Bernie. You could say it began with Occupy Wall Street. It, like you know, you can you can put a start point to it. But the idea is that those moments are short lived, though. So you need that, and then you need some other things to happen at the same time. So that's where the Teamsters coming in and the UPS contract fight. It's going to be key. When the Teamsters fought uh, UPS in 1997, they inspired you know, the labor movement in terms of like their slogan that part-time America doesn't work. We need to have those kinds of victories um, that energize and galvanize people. So that, that, I think that's something that it's already in the works based on what you just said and what, like, you know, Sean O'Brien and that reform slate has committed to. Um, but there's, you know, there's no real secret sauce here. I think the, the sauce is throwing spaghetti at the wall. <laughs> um, Let's see what wow, sticks. that's a great metaphor. Um, what? So, if this is a moment of momentum organizing, and these momentum moments do tend to be powerful, yet perhaps not permanent, where does the structure-based organizing fit into it? Yeah, well, again, I mean, I, I think that if we are doing our work well as unions, um, you know, we're, stir we're, we're in a constant process of stirring stuff up. Um, you know, some of the things that you just talked about, you know, are coordinating uh, contract expirations so that you can do, you know, industry or sector wide strikes, um, you know, it, it, so that you're engaging the maximum number of people at a focused compression point. Um, so that there is some ability to leverage things out of employers and elected officials that uh, wouldn't otherwise, you know, be on the map. Uh, so we got to we got to lead with our members. I think it's a really good place to start. Um, but again, you know, you think about Amazon. What something like a million workers across the country? I don't, God knows how many warehouses. Um, I, I 
I can't see the way that we get where we need to get if we're not figuring out how to coordinate. It's going to be different locals, I think, uh, different international unions, uh, many different locals. It'll be folks with radical politics. It'll be, you know, staff organizers. I mean, there has to be, I think, to succeed, uh, you know, something that reaches some, an amount of synergy. And that's, that's hard to achieve. It is very difficult to achieve, but it is not impossible. I think you're right that, like, the stuff is not rocket science. It's just really hard. It's really hard. Alex? Yeah. I mean, what I would add to that is often when I'm talking to people, you know, who maybe they don't work at Amazon, none of their friends or family work at Amazon, so they don't really see Amazon, right? They see the packages that get to their door. But they don't realize that, you know, the way Amazon operates geographically across the country is that there are entire communities where Amazon is only seen when the guy comes to your door to give you a package. And there are entire other communities where your entire family works at Amazon. It is the, it's almost like becoming a company town. It might be funding certain classes in the public high school. Your cousin works there. You and your dad both take the bus to Amazon. It is everything, right? And so I think I just, I lay out that geography because maybe a lot of you live in Brooklyn. Maybe a lot of people don't know Amazon workers. And so there's not really an under, I think, quite an immediate understanding for a lot of people of just how much organizing it's going to take, right? How many people we're talking about. And so, I mean, the Teamster is part of the importance of Sean O'Brien winning and actually sticking to his, his sort of pledge and, and the program they're implementing about organizing at Amazon is that they have a ton of members and those members are in communities where Amazon is drawing from for employment, right? There's simply, you just need everybody in. You need every UPS driver to be trained on how to talk to the Amazon driver that they're constantly running into on the route. Um, and so things like that, I think, are really key just to, to underline your point, Rob, about you know, what, what it would take um, to really to win this campaign. And I think there, you know, it's not rocket science, but there is a sense of urgency right now. I mean, I talked about the structural conditions um, that are kind of are interacting with people like Jazz, people like the ALU. Um, this moment doesn't last forever, right? Um, tight labor market. You know, in, you know, if inflation gets hit, you know, with a sort of if we get a recession, a sort of a, a sense from from those up top making policy that what's most important is to to cut down on inflation, even if it means that it's going to make the labor market a lot harder to operate in on the low wage end of the spectrum. Then these conditions change and people are much more concerned about getting fired for organizing a union. They don't know that they can find a new job. Wages don't go up as much anymore, maybe. Um, and so I think there is really an urgency right now that I think everybody in this room, I think the Teamsters as well, obviously LU, Starbucks, the workers, they all understand that this is the moment to do exactly what Louis said. There's a momentum here um, that these movements live or die by it right now as far as winning at corporations like Starbucks and at Amazon. I mean, Starbucks is, is a model right now of how this momentum is still building even as there's no first contract yet at any of these stores. And yet workers are seeing win after win elsewhere, and they're saying, you know what, I'm getting on board too. Um, and so there's a sense of, you know, this is the project that I want to stick with. I'm willing to stay and fight. And the ALU is going to need the exact same thing to happen, right? People are going to have to see that even if they don't win that first contract right now, this is a movement and it's spreading, and there's, and there's masses of people behind them backing them, including existing other unions. And so, yeah, it's a really, it's crucial um, that that sort of sense of seriousness exists right now. The, the Teamsters keep coming up. So what, how important is the new Teamsters leadership and how important will the fight, the contract fight with UPS next year be for the labor movement as a whole? Because I work at Labor Notes, I guess. <laughs> I, um, so, I mean, I think Alex mentioned this, you know, like the Teamsters have folks at every location in the country right now uh, Amazon represents an existential threat to the Teamsters. If you are a Teamster and you are trying to unionize a workplace and you don't get a solid contract, how are you going to be able to persuade someone to say, like, I'm going to sign this union card because the Teamsters have, you know, really strong contracts? So over the past, let me take a step back, over the past decades, beginning probably in the 1970s, the value of a union card has eroded. Every contract before 1970, you got higher and higher wages. And then that stopped. There was a collaboration between companies and, and unions to say, in order for us to not lose jobs off, to be, 
for jobs to be offshore somewhere else in search of cheaper labor, we're going to give these gift bags, right? What we have seen, we saw that with the John Deere strike, is like a, the beginning of a shift in that direction in terms of what Rob was talking about, unions as fighting institutions, class struggle unionism, if you will. Um, so what the Teamsters are putting out there is a class struggle unionism that has been gone from the scene for decades. So if they are going toe to toe with UPS, that is going to inspire other folks to take on, you know, other companies as well. And that's but the I, largest private sector contract that, in the country, right? That's the punchline. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, it's, it's very key and they've made billions of dollars. I think, uh, the Teamsters for a Democratic Union were tweeting this out last week, uh, how much profits they've made, even even as they're in battle with Amazon and as the Postal Service is fighting for survival. You know, UPS is making record profits and the Teamsters are not seeing that. So I think one of the things that that I that Amazon did, for instance, with the union busters in Alabama is that they would pull out an RWDSU contract and show it at the union busting meetings and say, I mean, they obviously distorted things and didn't show what the wages were, but they would say, look at Petco Foods. Look how much folks are earning there. They're earning 13 bucks an hour. You're earning 15. So I do think that the labor movement needs to take seriously um, that question of like the bread and butter issues. Because before we talk about industrial democracy, where Rob mentioned, where we're meeting workers at is how is this going to show up on my paycheck, right? Which is why ALU was, you know, really smart about how they put out that figure. We're going to demand $30, <laughs> right? And then that was a conversation starter. Um, so, so I think that the Teamsters are also raising expectations by taking on UPS. That, that's, that's why it's so important uh, for the labor movement. Rob? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, full respect to the importance of the UPS contract, but, but I would just say that it's it's not always just the bread and butter issues, and I'm, I'm, I think I'm bending the stick with what you said. Um, you know, we, we, we organized workers at a, a hospital affiliated with Yale. You know, I was a kid at the time, 40 years ago, but one of the leaders of that chapter who was a, you know, he was a red, um, working class Italian guy, said, it was the first time he, he remembered the contract finally where they got health insurance and, and got dental coverage for the first time at a hospital. Um, he was maybe the only white worker in that shop. The rest of the workers were all from mostly North Carolina, African-American folks who had left the Klan, right, and come up for opportunities. And, you know, I remember a conversation between this guy, Ray, and, and one of the longtime African-American leaders. And she just said, you know, we weren't scared of anything. We, we were fearless. And Ray started talking about the time where they won dental insurance. And, you know, a woman who had, you know, grown up in the deep South and had lost all her teeth because she had never had health insurance in her life came up and said, these are my union teeth. <laughs> so I, I, I just think there, there is so much that, you know, uh, people aspire to in terms of having some level of dignity uh, in their working lives and in their life around work, because most people hate to think about work, but they do like to think about, you know, do I get to spend some time with my kids or do I have to pick up four overtime this sh shifts this week so I can make rent? Okay. But, but, but the paycheck thing isn't the excitement. The excitement is I'd like to spend some time with my teenage kids who I haven't seen in 10 days. You know, and, and I, I feel like we, we've got to capture all of that because people want to live lives that are fulfilled and, 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 you know, contain real dignity. And we've just taken a long, long step away from that as a movement because for a lot of reasons, one of them, which is we don't have any power. Another one is that we just lack imagination sometimes. Alex. Yeah, I mean, I want to follow that, though it's totally now removed from the UPS contract. But I just, you know, one one thing that I think was hard not to notice about the pandemic was a lot of the key fights, especially unions that where workers went on strike, a lot of it was about hours. Not only want, it's not necessarily wanting more hours, a lot of people wanted less hours. They were being forced into mandatory overtime. 
um, as Amazon workers are, especially during peak season, but you know, especially in the food manufacturing sector, you had workers at Kellogg's, Nabisco, um, all kinds of companies working 80 hour weeks. You know, people said they'd worked 80 days straight, not a day off, right? You know, and this comes from the pandemic conditions where employers don't want to lay out the money for new workers to sufficiently staff um, their existing workplaces. And so they force the existing workers into overtime. Um, and those complaints persist, right? I mean, Amazon workers have all kinds of complaints about the hours. Um, certainly food service workers, I'm sure Starbucks workers included, have complaints about a lack of control over scheduling, right? So, you know, New York City has passed a law where it's meant to penalize companies that force workers into clopening, you know, working the closing shift and then the opening the next day for giving them schedules, you know, last minute. Um, a lot of employers are not really following those. Um, but these are sort of issues that I would consider pretty bread and butter, really. I mean, control over your day, control over, you know, can I schedule a doctor's appointment or do I have no idea what I'm working? Can I get child care or, you know, am I going to have to scramble last minute? Um, but I think it's important to note that that's what built the U.S. labor movement in the first place, right? The fight for an eight-hour day. A lot of people don't have eight-hour days anymore. They don't have weekends. And so I think sort of an expansion of, yes, uh, what you said, Rob, like a, se a sense of what dignity looks like and what a livable life and a livable job look like. You know, these things have really been politicized again by the conditions of the pandemic where people felt that the stakes were much higher and they were questioning, am I going to keep this job that is risking not only my health, but that of my family and my time with my children. A lot of people didn't, they quit and left. Um, and I think it's a live question. And again, you know, these sort of, this communalization, this thing we all went through with the past couple of years, it provides an opening, I think, to think a little bit broader um, about what we're willing to fight, um, fight and strike over. I wanna close by, by asking something that I also asked Jazz and, and Chris. We see all over the place, uh, growing number of militant socialists taking jobs as salts. And obviously this has a long history in American socialism and communism and in the labor movement and I'm sure in other countries as well, but I'm more familiar with the American case. What role do you all see salts and militant socialists, whether they're, they're salts or not, playing in turning things around for the labor movement? Um, I mean, I think you you need self-conscious socialist militants in, in any movement. Um, you know, sometimes those folks can take greater risks. I think they play a, kid, a critical role in terms of, um, uh, Karl Marx mentioned somewhere, like the muck of the ages, that we're all like covered in muck, right? So in terms of thinking um, creatively and expanding our horizons of what is possible, I think that as facilitators, SALT can play that role of... Um, of bringing that, but it has to be it has to be worker led, um, though. So it's like salts to the background, uh, workers to the forefront, um, and that that ultimately means is is that you need really talented organizers. Because what a good organizer does is, I, I mean, sometimes people used to say this. I, I don't necessarily believe it, but I think it's uh, it's useful. Is that a good organizer organizes themselves out of a job uh, kind of thing. Um, I think a good organizer is someone that facilitates the leadership of someone else, or a good organizer creates more leaders as opposed to concentrating power in their own hands. Um, and I, I think uh, salts can play that role. Um, you know, we are embedded in a capitalist society where everything, individualism triumphs overall. Um, and I think having those difficult conversations that kind of political education within a union is very important. Um, and that's where the question of democracy in our unions comes in. Like where, where do we have those debates um, about what kind of society we are building? What kind of movement are we? Um, I think that unions can be a place for that. Um, but, it, but it has to begin by meeting workers where they're at. Yeah, I'll just say that you know, I think often when we talk about salts, we're thinking about like a union that exists has now sent you in, like Unite Here sent you to work at a hotel and organize that hotel. I think really the most interesting conversation and thing we're seeing right now is something, I mean, Jazz sort of said this earlier, that, you know, for example, Democratic Socialists of America, as well as the youth wing YDSA, you know, there's an intentional training of, you know, we're taking rank and file jobs in industries we think are important whether you know, it's nursing, healthcare, UPS work, Starbucks, Amazon, you know, this is an intentional 
kind of entry into the workforce or switch of careers um, because you're a socialist militant worker, right? It's you're not a socialist. And then there are workers. You are a 22 year old who just finished college and has a lot of debt. And you're saying, what job do I want to take? Well, I want to build a fighting labor movement. So I'm going to become a UPS driver. And so I think that is really key. Um, those programs, you know, it's not a ton of people that are doing it. But, you know, there's that is, I think, something that has that lays the groundwork for something in the future. Um, and I think, you know, you're seeing it at especially, say, Starbucks, but all kinds of companies um, where when you dig into who was sort of the key leading person in a store or a workplace who was arguing, you know, had the sort of ideological grounding and said, no, we deserve better. And they d weren't affected by the by the boss's arguments. Often they were a diehard Sanders supporter or, or they, you know, they were involved in, yeah, the George Floyd uprisings and had a sense of their own power and dignity. Um, and so I just, you know, I think that is more important, this sort of broader pol political kind of shift that's happening, particularly among young people. And it's organic in that sense. You know, assault is just a person who has the, a willingness to fight. Um, and so I think those are the people that are playing really important roles at all kinds of union, com uh, union campaigns right now. Rob? Yeah, look, I, I, I think that we've got some a ways to go before we are trending in the direction of being a movement that becomes more than the sum of its parts. I, I don't think we have that. I think we have fragments of a movement. Uh, you know, if we if we hit the place where we're a movement, I think it's going to take lots of different people from lots of different backgrounds. Um, I, I think what we need is people who are committed fighters who understand that, uh, you know, power on the job can change people's lives. We need folks who are willing to root themselves in workplaces, in communities, um, you know, in their relationship to their coworkers. Um, and and that can take some time. Um and I also don't think that there's a choice, okay? Because um, you know we we are um, heading to a place that is just getting uglier and uglier for workers. And again, we're seeing that there are folks who are ready to do some heroic things uh, to change that. So um, now is the time for experimentation, I would say. And and by the way, one of the great things about the labor movement is you know it's it's a place where just based on having a workplace where people come and are trying to put food on the table. You've got Republicans and you've got people who are apolitical and you've got socialists and, you know, forcing those folks to come together and figure out how to work it out in the direction of having, you know, some, some power um, is a place where you see people really change. And that, that's an amazing process to be a part of. Well, Rob Burrill, Alex Press and Luis Feliz Leon, thank you very, very much. And thanks to Chris Smalls and Jazz Brizak. And thank you, everyone, so much for coming. Um, we'll, you can give a round of applause now, I guess. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not used to doing this in front of people. Um, it, we're heading over to Local NYC, which is a beer garden um, at one Penn Plaza, uh, right across from Penn Station afterwards for anyone who wants to come. And also, if you have not done so yet, please make a monthly contribution to the dig if you are a listener or planning on becoming one there's a qr code right at the door there on the way out that you can just point your phone at that's patreon.com slash the dig thank you to jacobin thank you to the people's forum and the people's forum i believe also wants to say uh bye to you on the way out before you get up um but yeah thank you so much this was really wonderful everyone. Thank you so much, Dan, and to this incredible lineup of speakers, of organizers, and workers, and thinkers, and writers. This is a fantastic evening. I'm, my name is Lianne. I just wanted to say a quick greeting from the People's Forum. I'm the education director here, and I wanted to just welcome you all. If it's been your first time here, please don't make it your last time. We love having full house like this. We have, you can just come anytime, whether we have an event or not, to come check out our books, read, ch chat with each other, have some, our cafe is closed today, but usually it's open. Um, and I also just wanted to take the opportunity to tell you about some uh, an exciting project we're working on. Um, I don't know if, if you've heard of the Summit of the Americas, um, which is a, every couple of years, the Organization of Ameri American States holds a meeting of supposedly all the states in North and South America uh, to discuss democracy, free trade, and all of these things. Um, it's happening in the U.S. this year, this summer, in June, for the first time in decades. 
Um, and it's, of course, the Organization of American States is funded by the US. The definition of democracy is set by the US. Um, so we are organizing a counter summit. Um, I don't think I have to tell this room, but the definition of democracy set by the White House serves capital, doesn't serve humanity. So we want to have a really strong showing. It will be happening in Los Angeles, but we need the help of everybody. Um, so we have little cards up at the front desk. If you take it, there's a link to social media and our website. Even though this is happening in California, it's not happening in New York. I'm sure everyone here knows someone in California. Please ask them to participate. Please share the information. We need to show the world that in North America, there is struggle against capitalism. There is struggle against these, the, the, the arm of foreign policy of the United States and uh, that we are in transnational solidarity across this region. So we need all of your help to spread the word. So if you have any questions, you can find me um, and talk to me or talk to any People's Forum staff and hope to see you again very soon. And thanks again to the organizers of this amazing event. Have a great night.